Shabbat Shalom. So, Carrie's out of town this week for school. Uh, they do an annual end of year trip. So, I've had uh, five days of being a solo parent, which uh, those of you who've done that know that there's an automatic rule, which means that at least one of your kids will get sick while you're uh, the only adult in the house, which happened on Tuesday. Uh, when one of our kids, had a, Ezra, had an allergic reaction to something. Uh, and so I took him to the doctor, and the doctor gave him uh, a medicine that, you know, is a, has to be taken very specifically, a step-down medicine, uh, which, uh, so I came home, I made a chart to make sure, solo parenting here, that I'm not going to be the one who forgets to give the kid his medicine when he's got an allergy. And of course, the last day on the chart is Hannah's bat mitzvah. So we're literally counting days uh, until, until the bat mitzvah, which is my way of saying that usually on Shabbat, uh, we like to look back uh, at the week that's behind us in order to have a clean slate, to take this day as a day that's different from the other uh, days, the previous days that we've had. But in our family, we are very much counting forward, uh, as we know that Next Shabbat, uh, our daughter, our first child, will have her bat mitzvah. It's a first for us. So uh, given that I've done, I don't know how many b'nai mitzvah, uh, it is my first time as a father uh, having a uh, bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah in our family. So tonight, uh, and given the fact that I'm not really allowed to speak much next week, uh, I figured tonight I could share a little bit about what I've learned, not so much as a rabbi, but as a father watching my daughter go through this process uh, and thinking about what it looks like from what we might call the other side of the table. The bar brought mitzvah, what's now called, by the way, a bee mitzvah. It's a, a, it's a newer term that's coming up. Um, I've gotten used to it. You will too. It takes some time, but it's, uh, it's an easier way than, than having to explain what B'nai Mitzvah means. If you think about the, if you think about a B Mitzvah, it's different than any other rite of passage. In other words, at least how it is today. So uh, it doesn't celebrate a change in status like our other life cycle rituals. You get married, you go from being single to being a couple. Um, when you're born, you go from being not a person to being a person. When you die, you go from being a person to not a person. Everything, something changes. You go from being not in mourning to being in mourning, from not being a parent to being a parent. So our, our titles change in most of our life cycle rituals. And you could say that that is true of our B'nai Mitzvah students, that they go from being children to being adults. But the reality is they don't. They are not actually adults the day they turn 13. Not in our society, not today. So too, you could say that rites of passage are about, uh, they're about proving that you're worthy of something. And you could say that the rituals that we expect our students to recite and reading the Torah and standing before a large group of people in your synagogue is our test of sorts uh, to prove that you're worthy of this inheritance. In fact, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of cultures have had rituals like this. Ancient Greece would send their 12-year-old boys out, give them a spear and a blanket, and send them out into the wilderness and see if they came back. And if they came back successful, uh, having hunted something, then they were considered a man in their society. So again, if we're honest, though, while the process of studying for a bar bat mitzvah is intimidating, while standing before a lot of people in a sanctuary and uh, leading a service in a language that's more than likely not your first language is not exactly simple, um, it's not the same as being sent out and wondering if you'll survive or not. In other words, if you stand up on this bima for your bar about mitzvah, you have already succeeded. This is not a test. We don't wonder whether you're going to make it or not by the end of the service. And yet, this is often how we talk about 
a bar about mitzvah. It is a test of whether you're authentically Jewish or not. Somebody might say, uh, well, I had a bar mitzvah. That's how Jewish I am. I passed that test, and some might say, once I have a bar about mitzvah, I don't have to do anything anymore because I've done everything you asked me to do. As uh, Rabbi Amichal Levine said, this has become our sort of central ceremony that if you ask most Jews if they've been to a Torah service or even a Shabbat service, you might find that they, the average Jewish person would say, well, I haven't been to that many Shabbats, but I've been to lots of bar about mitzvahs. Ask a person who's not Jewish, well, have you ever been to a synagogue? Oh, yeah, I've been to a bar about mitzvah. It seems that that service, which again doesn't mark anything that has actually changed in a kid's life, that service has become our primary focus. But it shouldn't feel like a test that you have to pass, and it isn't really marking any of the ancient rites of passages. And so now I've been able to watch my daughter prepare to become a bat mitzvah. And I would say it's an incredible rite of passage that we're very lucky to have. That might not surprise you. Uh, but here are the ways that I've seen for her that it's been, and for us, that it's really been a moment in time that has changed something for us. Uh, and the first is, it's a celebration of the village that has grown around the child. So it invites, what I mean by this is, what we've seen happening over these last few months, and especially as the day comes closer, it invites all the people who know and love this child to come forward and acknowledge that to her. Not to us, the parents. We know who they are. But the child doesn't necessarily know all of the people who are in her village. Whether it's giving a gift or writing a note or even just saying, I I'm so looking forward to your bat mitzvah. I know your bat mitzvah is coming up. I've been watching Hannah as she's talking with people, some of whom she knows well and some of whom she doesn't. But all people who, by acknowledging her simcha coming up, are saying, I know you, I care about you, and I believe by doing so, they're also telling her whether she realizes it or not, that if they're present enough in her life to celebrate her, they're also present enough in her life to help her on the days that aren't her happiest days. And so she's coming to know the faces and the names of all the people who are in her village, who know her. And as a parent, one of the pieces that's become surprising, I would say to us, uh, that we weren't expecting in this process, were the numbers of conversations that we've had with her about the people she doesn't know, but whom we know care deeply about her. As we invited people, or as we heard back from people, she's like, who is this? We would say, well, that was your first babysitter. That was the neighbor who watched you when your brothers were born. These are people who care about you and follow your life. You may not know who they are, but your village is a lot bigger than you think it is. And the last part about the village is that I think she's coming to see is that it's her unique village. In other words, all of us have, we could say, well, we're a part of the temple community. But the temple community is not centered on me or you or any one individual. But there is a unique group of people that each of us have in our life that are only connected by us as an individual. And our daughter's bat mitzvah seems to be a ceremony that is drawing all of those people to declare that they're a part of her village to her because of her, not because of an allegiance to something else or because they like the same football teams or they go to the same school or live in the same neighborhood. The only commonality among all of these people is simply that they know and love her. It's gotten to such a point that, in fact, uh, when it was Noah's birthday, our middle child, at the beginning of April, we started talking about what he might want for his birthday. He said, you mean we're going to have a day that's not all about Hannah in these months? <laughs> Which was true. But I think there's a lot of value in a 12-year-old learning how many people are actually living life with them. So that's been one of the major takeaways that we're, we're blessed to have watched. 
The second is that it seems to be a liminal moment of measurement, which is a lot of big words, but what I mean by that is time stops and then we measure everything by this moment, it seems. Today in the car, in fact, uh, Hannah was saying to me, and this has happened a lot lately, she says, you know, Dad, in five years I'm going to be going to college. So I started Googling colleges. <laughs> but I would tell you that more than probably any other time in our life with her, we've been saying things like, you know, five years ago, or five years from now, or in two years you'll be doing this, or it was only three years ago that that happened. It seems to be that this time stops. Again, arbitrarily, because there's nothing different about being a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old that is so drastically, it's not like having a wedding or a funeral. There's not something that marks that time other than the fact that we decided this is the time we're going to mark. And so we start measuring where were you, where will you be. It's what we, some have called a stopping point to ask, who am I? And it's one that uh, I think is fitting because many of us as adults can very vividly remember, if not our bar or bat mitzvah, we can remember exactly what it felt like to be 13. And so I can think of exactly where I was when I was her age, who my friends were, what I was doing. I remember my bar mitzvah, and now I see her and I can compare apples to apples. How different is your life from what my life was at that very particular moment where my family and my community also stopped my life to assess. Who was I then? And now I get to look back and say, well, look who I became. And I'm looking at her and saying the same thing. I think it reminds the kids especially because uh, a piece of these, this liminal moment of measurement is also that uh, you could say it's expensive, uh, which it is no matter what your celebration is. It's like most Jewish celebrations, it's not an a inexpensive endeavor. But there are a lot of things in life that our kids see that are expensive. Rarely do they see that our time and our money stop for them. And I think that's part of what makes this a liminal moment for her. The number of times that we've said we can't, it's Hannah's bat mitzvah, is infinite. People say, well, can you come to this meeting on Thursday the 8th? Nope, I can't. That's the week of Hannah's bat mitzvah. I'm sure my parents are saying the same. I'm sure that uh, her close friends are saying the same when they get invitations to play in a softball tournament or when people ask what we're doing. It seems to stop, and I think, again, for a 12-year-old kid to know that the world can stop for them for a moment is powerful. And finally, I'm going to very much quote, again, Rabbi Amichal Lau Levine. It was a, a wonderful, uh, there's a podcast uh, in which he shares, he's a rabbi of this innovative synagogue called the Lab Shul, named well. Um, and they've created, they've gone through a process of creating a, a very different type of bar and bat mitzvah service. But he was interviewed about what his experience has been as they've really thought outside the box as to what this moment means. And I think, I think he shows something that's really unique about this moment for our kids. In comparison to other cultures who have their young people go out and hunt or who uh, have them act like adults in some way, have them dress up. In ancient Greek culture, again, they would get their first toga when they would turn 12 so they could look like adults. They would have a mentor. Uh, I'm sure there are all sorts of rituals and traditions that you may have in your family or you may know of, of when uh, girls become women and boys become men that, that, are, uh, that are shared. The Jewish experience is, according to Rabbi Levy, is to let them tell a story. We are storytellers. He says, we're storytellers because our people had to move around so much that what was most valuable to us were the stories that we carried. And so when our children go to become an adult, what we ask of them is that you learn how to tell 
our story and your story. It's really remarkable if you think about it. With just over a decade of life under their belts, we give the microphone over to a 13-year-old. We give them our undivided attention and ask them to teach us something that they know about the world that we don't. We tell them that they're actually an expert. We put our ancient story before them in their hands and ask them to read it in an ancient language. We tell them that they have the ability to lead us in prayer. He calls this an opportunity to think about growing up as a human with Jewish tools to help you. It's a way of saying to a young adult, your voice is an important, vital voice for our people. And so it's not surprising that when our children leave their bar about mitzvah, they are often showing that they are on this high place where they feel that they can conquer the world because now they see what their world really looks like. They realize they have the power to stop time, to call upon the people who love them, the many, many people who love them and know them, and ask them to gather on their account. They realize that they can speak their mind, that they can share their story, and that people will listen. And so with those tools, I think we're just so lucky. For all the reasons that it was created, perhaps none of those were the originals, but that we have this moment where our children get to experience some of the best parts of truly being an adult. And so I don't think it's a graduation ceremony or a finish line or a test, but I do think it's a launching pad, a place in which from that foundation they can hopefully grow into the people that they will become. And so next week I will shut up and enjoy my daughter, and she will enjoy that I won't say too much. She probably will be a little embarrassed by the few things I do say. But I wanted to share this tonight because it is a wonderful feeling to be able to watch your child see her village, stop time, speak her mind. And it's a wonderful feeling to see the many people beyond ourselves who love our children and who will be with them as they become the people that they should be. So for all of you, for the many people who aren't listening or uh, whom I won't be able to say it to, it really is, has been our uh, great pleasure and honor to be able to watch how people have reached out, how they love the people that we love, uh, how they help us through things that we can't do ourselves and make things happen. Uh, and we really feel blessed uh, to be a part of this community and to have met so many people along the way. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>